How does the coronavirus or COVID-19 impact your criminal case? There's been a lot of questions surrounding this issue, and we've seen courts around the country close down. But what about the people who have had a pending case? What if they were right in the middle of their case and suddenly the courts are closed and everybody's locked down on quarantine? What's going to happen to their case as it moves forward? Or what if at the very beginning of your case, let's say you just got arrested, but no charges have actually been filed yet. Are those charges coming? What can you expect? Or what about if you were just really close to getting to a trial or getting close to the resolution in your case and now the courts are closed? What is that going to mean for you? What is this going to mean for everybody? That's what we're going to talk about today. And the coronavirus is causing a lot of turmoil and it doesn't leave our courts untouched. And so today we're answering the question specifically, how does COVID-19 impact the timing of of my criminal case. And when I talk about timing, timing is very important for criminal law. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. I've got 29 different slides that we're going to get to. So before I do that, before we dive in, I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of who this video is for and who it's not for. I want to save you some time. If you listen to this next slide or two and you find this was not the right video for you, well then good, we're gonna save you some time and you can go about your day. But really, who is this for? Who is this gonna help and who is this not gonna help? So first and foremost, this is gonna be for people who have a current criminal case. So that means, as I sort of explained at the very beginning of the video, you've got something that's pending. You either arrested and charges are forthcoming or you were right in the middle of your case, or you're getting close to the end of the case, but you've got a current criminal case. This is, this is important. If you don't have a current criminal case, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot of value out of this. The other thing that I wanna make sure you understand this is for, this is for you, is if you have an interest in understanding about the concept of time in criminal law. So time is very important. It, it involves things surrounding due process and the Sixth Amendment. And here, we're only talking about timing in in criminal law and as it relates to criminal criminal cases uh, this doesn't apply or I don't know anything about family law or, or uh, bankruptcy cases or timing in any of those other issues uh, I what I remember is I, what I remember from law school and it's been a long time since I've been back there so this is criminal law we spent a lot of time in criminal law and this is what all we're talking about today now it's important to also know that you you cannot file a motion on someone else's behalf. So if you're trying to watch this video for somebody else, uh, that's great. You can help them. You can provide a lot of information to them that's contained in this video or show them this video. But if you're, if you're watching it for someone else, you can't file or do anything on behalf of somebody else unless, of course, you are a lawyer. So if those sound good, then let's stick to it. But this video is not for people who are looking for just a very quick dismissal. Uh, it, it's very unlikely that COVID-19 is going to actually automatically mean that your case gets dismissed or that it's all just going to go away. In fact, it's probably likely that it's not going to really materially change your case a whole lot regardless. So if you're looking for sort of, you know, a, a, a pot at the end of the rainbow in this video, you're probably not going to get it. I do have some pretty good ideas on some things that I think you can do that will help your case. We're going to save those to the end of the video. But if you're just looking for a quick dismissal or looking for a quick answer, that's not this video. We're going to dive into a lot of other things. And so as I mentioned, it's, it's really, I got a lot to cover here. There's a lot of meat and potatoes in this video. And so if you're looking Looking for just a short answer, I'll give it to you right now. The answer is that your case for the time being is going to be on pause while society is figuring out what to do with the coronavirus. So that's the easy answer. Now, if you want to dive into the specifics, that's what we're going to get into in this video. If you don't want to learn the specifics, just call your court and figure out what's going on in your case. The other thing that this video is not going to cover the rules in all 50 of the different specific states. We're not going to cover all of the different states. I can only tell you the general specifics, but you're going to need to contact your local court, understand your local state rules if that's you know something that you want to get into in depth. Uh, it's it, it's largely the same across the board. I mean, they're similar rules. We're going to talk about that when we get into due process and those types of things. But for first and foremost, right now, what we want to talk about is the coronavirus and a little bit of background there. The coronavirus, as we all know, has been shutting down everything throughout the country, throughout the world. And 
this includes the courts. This includes your cases, criminal cases, judges are staying home, prosecutors are staying home, defense attorneys are staying home. So what are we to do about this sort of backlog of cases that are still pending and are in the criminal courts? There's a lot of moving parts and everybody's trying to figure it out. And so I'm going to break down sort of my analysis of what's happening in the justice system as we speak. Now, I want to share with you what I call the beginning to winning framework. So this is part of the beginning to winning legal education series. In my office, we try to help good people charged with crimes. And one of the ways that we do that is providing them with some information. And so one of the ways that I've sort of consolidated and made it a little bit more digestible, a little bit more uh, understandable is by detailing this and breaking this down into nine different steps that I call the beginning to winning framework. And it looks like this. This is something that I've created. We've been using it internally here at our office for some time, but I've never actually shared it on this channel. So this is the beginning to winning framework. And you can see here at the bottom left, you've got the beginning section. This is where we're starting. And we're going to slowly progress through each one of these different uh, categories, these different uh, points as we get and work our way through the case up to winning and getting a good result in your case. Now, this, when we're talking about the coronavirus and COVID-19, this is really impacting all of this. So everything that you just saw there is being impacted by the virus. Everything from finding a lawyer to negotiating to conducting interviews to going to court and getting results and closing cases, that's all been disrupted. And so it really encompasses the entire portion of what you see here. Now, I'm going to break down a little bit more specifically about what all of this means and how we can navigate through it. But first, let me give you just a little bit of background on who I am so you know and, and can decide whether or not you want to take my word for it. I am a licensed lawyer. I was licensed in Arizona in 2013, federal court 2014, California 2015, and the U.S. Supreme Court 2016. Founding partner over here at the r, &R Law Group. We've got seven lawyers over here and growing. We've handled thousands of criminal cases, and I am also the author of a book, the host of a show, and I'm on a board of directors for a nonprofit, so on and so forth. Those are my credentials, uh, and take them for what you will. Now, I want to be clear that we will not be giving you any actual legal advice in this video. I am not your lawyer and I cannot give you legal advice. This is a one-way conversation and I don't know anything about your case. So use your best judgment when you're making decisions or using any information that is contained in this video, consult with an attorney. I always recommend people consult with an attorney, whether you're watching this in Florida, I don't take cases in Florida, hire a Florida lawyer, or at least consult with a Florida lawyer, because they're going to know better than, than I can. They're going to know a lot more than you're going to be able to get from a YouTube video. And so just keep that in mind. That's my general disclaimer. You're going to hear a lot of that from me in the beginning to winning series. So let's talk about the foundation of all of this stuff. We're talking a lot about timing. And now that the coronavirus has sort of put a pause in place on a lot of what's going on in the world, where does this, this issue of timing come for, from? And, and how does that impact your case? And what are the repercussions going to be? But, but really, what is the foundation of that? Why is this so important? It comes down to a concept that we spend a lot of time on in law school, and it's called due process. Due process is a very important concept. We spend, I, I think it's like, the two semesters, yeah, it may be one semester on substantive due process, another semester on procedural due process. It's a lot. There's a lot of material that goes into it. But by and large, I want to give you some basic definitions on what due process is, just so you have an understanding. This is going to lay the framework before we get into more and more of the timing issues. So what is due process? Due process is the legal requirement that the state must respect all legal rights owed to a person and cannot harm a person without following the exact course of the law. And so that's kind of a lot there. We want to dissect that down a little bit. It's this legal requirement, whether it's the federal government or the state government, that the government, the, the, the body that, that controls everything that we, you know, a lot of what we do in our world, they cannot take your rights away. They cannot harm you without going through a very rigid, very formal process. If they're going to take away one of your rights, like your, your right to be free and put you in jail, that process has to be the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. It has to be very rigid. It has to follow these different protections. Otherwise, there's a lot of room for abuse there. And so when we look at due process, we're taking a look at some different parts of the U.S. Constitution. The Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, they both have a due process clause. The Fifth Amendment says that 
no person shall be deprived of any of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The 14th Amendment says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So you see there, both in the 5th Amendment and the 14th Amendment, this concept of due process of law. And the 5th Amendment was the federal government, and then the 14th Amendment brought that down to the states. So it applies all across the board. Due process is something that you can say uh, unequivocally as part of American constitutional law. It is the backbone of our justice system, in, in my opinion. I think it's very important. And there are some examples in criminal law that are sort of easy to understand so you can sort of flesh out what due process means related to what we're talking about here. So a couple, three examples that I came up with briefly, but it's the right to know about the evidence against you, right? So if you've been charged with a crime, you want to know what what evidence do they have if they've taken you to, uh, you know, drawn your blood in a DUI case? We want to make sure that they have the blood and we can go test it. We want to know what's in it. We want to have it available so that we can have our own independent test. And so all of these different things are, are important. We want to know what the evidence says against me or against you. The ability to cross-examine witnesses. So this is the idea that if somebody's going to be testifying against you in court, you have the right to ask them questions and confront them, to cross-examine them. And finally, the same with the right to counsel. So this is your ability to have an attorney, have somebody there uh, representing you in court. Believe it or not, a lot of these things, they didn't used to be rights or in other governments still throughout the world. A lot of this stuff is not happening. You can be charged with a crime and not see any of the evidence. Somebody can accuse you of something thing and you don't get to ask them any questions. Those are all sort of uh, against or egregious violations of what we would consider to be basic fundamental due process rights. So to illustrate, I came up with an example that I think everybody is familiar with, everybody knows, everybody can relate to. And of course, like all things in life, when we need a good lesson, we always turn to the Lion King. So this is my example of due process. We've got these two characters. We've got Simba. Uh, no, we've got Mufasa. This is before he dies. We've got Mufasa and we've got Scar. And you, you sort of can just understand how each one of these different characters rules the kingdom of the Lion King, the Lion Kingdom. And in, in Mufasa's case, there's order, there's, there's rule of law, there's mechanisms in place. There are certain areas that you can go and you can't go and ha everybody's happy and the sun is shining and there's animals kind of bouncing around all over the place. That was due process. When Scar comes into power, we see him sort of decimate that. He just takes the food that he wants. It doesn't matter what the other customs were, or what the other laws were, or the other traditions were. He takes more and more land away from other people. He starts executing people. He killed uh, Mufasa without. He killed yeah Mufasa without uh, you know any any due process. Just threw him right off the uh, off the side of a cliff. That's sort of chaotic. That's the lack of due process that we see here in the Lion King. And so uh, hopefully that will help you understand understand a little bit about you know how this works it helps uh me explain this to 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 several people and it's kind of crystal clear so hopefully that is is a uh, overly simplistic but it's a good understanding one has order one has disorder so when we talk about due process one of the fundamental sort of tenets of it is the idea of a right to a speedy trial a speedy trial you've probably heard this uh, in movies and TV shows, they'll say things like, uh, you know, I have a right to a trial. I want my day in court. You can't deny me my due process, whatever they say in these types of things. But the idea is that you get a trial soon. The reason why this is so important is because let's say, for example, you're arrested and you're taken into custody and they're just going to keep you there for years and years and years. There was that movie in the Count of Monte Cristo where they, they take him in and they lock him up away and they say your, your trial is going to be in you know 20 years or something like that. That is a total deprivation of somebody's rights. If you keep them sort of in custody, keep them in jail, or you keep them in a position where they're encumbered a little bit, they can't travel, or they have to wear an ankle monitor, or they're on home detention, or they're reporting to a, a pretrial services person. Person, that's a violation of their liberty. They're taking away something that is a right to them. And so in order to, to protect that, to secure that, we want to make sure that we have a trial that takes place soon, sooner rather than later, so that we can d determine are, are these deprivations of their liberty good or are they bad? And, and are they going to be permanent or are we going to give them back to that person? So a speedy trial is very important. It's got a strong basis 
in our Constitution, and I want to point it out just so you can have, have an understanding of where this comes from, it's in the Sixth Amendment, and it says very specifically right there, in all criminal prosecutions, the, incu the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy trial. And that's a screen clipping directly from the Constitution, but I just read to you what it actually says. It's sort of, you've heard the phrase that justice delayed is justice denied. And in, in many respects, that's kind of what the Constitution was getting at here. Now, it is important to understand that this is, a, this is present in every criminal case. The government has an obligation to gather and process and present the evidence quickly. And the repercussions for that, the repercussions for not doing that quickly are severe. They're drastic. And in fact, it can even be a dismissal of the case. So if the government violates the speedy trial laws, the speedy trial rights, it can mean that your whole case gets dismissed. So now, wait a minute, we've got COVID-19 and the coronavirus going on. Everything is being delayed. What, what does that mean for my case? Is this a violation of my right to a speedy trial? It's a great question, and we're going to get there very shortly. But let's go back. So what is the, the speedy trial rights? What are the general rules? It's around six months in most states. That's sort of the general rule. It's the general baseline rule. They can be longer. They, they can be longer under certain circumstances and they can definitely be shorter, but it must be held about within six months. And if it's not, the penalty can be severe. It can be a dismissal. Okay, so that's the foundation. That is the, the concept of due process. That's the concept of speedy trials. Now let's see how it works. So I wanna show you a timeline, a, a little progression here that we can, we can run through. And here's what sort of the general standard progression of a, of a criminal case looks like. So you can see my arrow pointer here. You've got the arraignment. This is going to be your initial court date. So this is the very beginning court date that you have. And we call this one basically day zero. Okay, so if you get arrested, that's going to happen over here before any of this stuff. Or it may happen on the same night. You may have your arraignment on the same night. Then you're going to have a series of different court dates. We call these pre-trial conferences. A number of different pre-trials where different things are happening. It can be that you're reviewing police reports, you're communicating with prosecutors, you're having uh, different settlement conferences, you're presenting uh, you know, motions. All sorts of different things can happen. But but typically we just lump them into a category. We call them pre-trial proceedings or PTCs, pre-trial conferences. Different states have different names for them. That's not really important. The important part is that it looks like this. And you can just kind of run through the timeline from pre-trial conference to pre-trial conference all the way up until you get to a trial. So if you remember what I said previously was that we're, we're concerned about the timeliness. So how fast is all of that happen? How, how condensed is this entire process going to take? And when we're talking about speedy trials, as I said, if we're going to use the baseline of six months or 180 days, if we're just going to say, as a general rule, we're going to say that's close enough across the country that we're going to use that as our, as our, as our number here, what does that look like? Well, here's what we have. This is the timeline when everything happens within 180 days. You've got from your arraignment, from the first time you saw a judge, all the way through these different pre-trial proceedings, all the way to, an, uh, to a trial, it's all taking place within 180 days. So that is the speedy trial limitation. Now, if, if that all happens, you saw it's green, it's good. Everything, it's no problem. We can resolve the case. The case is closed. The person who was charged with the crime does whatever they need to do as a result of the penalty, or if they're uh, not found not guilty or they're not convicted, then they have to enjoy the rest of their lives. They're, they're done and they're, they're out from under the burden of a criminal uh, proceeding and a criminal conviction. But what happens if it's outside of that 180 days? Then it looks something like this. So you have your arraignment, you have your a number of different pretrials, and for whatever reason, the trial takes place after the 180 days. So let's just say in our example example here, when we're just using general rules, let's say the trial takes place 181 days after the initial arraignment. So from the beginning to the end, it's outside of the speedy trial requirement that should be in your local state statutes. You need to find out what that is for your particular jurisdiction. If it's outside of that, then the penalty can be that it's all being dismissed, which is obviously a good thing if you are a criminal defendant. So you want to keep a close eye on that. Okay, so does that mean that all cases are resolved within the speedy trial deadline? 
No, it's more complicated than that. In fact, most are not resolved within that timeline. So how do you how do you get away with this? How do cases go on for nine months or 12 months or two years? What's the deal here? Isn't that a violation of my right to a speedy trial? You just went through due process. We said that was in the fifth and the 14th amendment. You just went through the sixth amendment and you just detailed you know, the, the, the brilliant analogy between Scar and Mufasa. So clearly this stuff is, is ingrained in American society. So how are cases lasting that long? Well, the reason that we can do that is because what we do is what's called waiving time, okay, or it's called excluding time. And when we break it down onto a timeline, just like we've been looking at, it looks like this. So here, follow, follow with me here. Let's say we have an arraignment, and again, again, that's on day zero. And at that initial court date, what happens is there is a continuance. So they, the judge says, I'm going to read you what you've been charged with. I'm going to give you a new court date. And that's going to be in about 50 days, 30 days in your jurisdiction, 60 days in some other jurisdictions. But let's just say for simplicity's sake, it's going to be 50 days. You have your first pretrial conference. Okay, so all of that time, all of those days, all 50 of those days we're going to include in our calculation against the speedy trial requirement. So that's 50 of the 180 days we can subtract. So now we're down to 130 days. All right, so we come back. And we have a pretrial conference that the attorney's going to go to, and they're, they're going to have done a bunch of work prior to this pretrial proceeding, and they're going to be prepared, and they're going to go to it. But something is going to something new is going to come up. So let's say, for example, when we go back into court at that first pretrial conference, the prosecutor comes back and says that they are they have a plea offer that they would like to give us here. And they present it to us and we say, thank you for that. We're going to take it back to our client. We're going to need some more time to review it. So we ask for a continuance and we exclude those 50 days because that's our continuance. That's the defense's continuance. We asked for that time. We said we need time because we need to communicate with our client or we need to go do an interview or we need to consult with our own expert witnesses or there are a million different reasons why we ask for time. But those 50 days are not included. So let's go back and we want to say, okay, well, who's including the remainder of the time? We go back to court for pretrial two. Prosecutor says, well, now they need to consult with their expert witness or they need to do something else like that. And we say, that's fine, but we're not going to give that time to you. We're going to include that. That's your time. That's government's time. And so it's your burden to do what you need to get done and come back on that because we're taking that time away from you. So we're going to add another 50 days, subtract that from the 180. And so now we're down pretty considerably. Now we come back and we ask for a continuance again, because we need to decide whether we're taking a trial or not, or we're going to take a plea deal or go take our case to trial. There's a lot of conversations we have. We may need to consult or do more interviews or whatever it is we're doing. Point is we ask for more time. So that time is not included. And then finally, the government's Last continuance is before a trial, or let's say they they we're going to include that time. We come back to pre-trial four. We reject the plea deal, and we say we're going to go to trial. That's great. Trial is going to be scheduled 50 days later, which is no problem because it's within the 150. It's with which with within the speedy trial deadline. You can see here. So if we're using that again, is if the speedy trial deadline is 180 days, and we only included these these three 50 day buckets, that's only 150 days of the 180 days. That's a lot. Okay. Most of this stuff, your attorney, the court keeps track of the prosecutor's office keeps track of. We keep, keep track of that. You don't necessarily need to go through and count the days. You certainly can in, in a criminal case, you certainly can do that. And, and cases can be won in, in, a violation of those rules. So if you want to you know, take a look at that, that's how this works. What was included, what was not included. And so you can see here that this is all, this is all pretty important. The government gets some time, the defense gets some time. So now what the heck is going on? Because we're stuck right in the middle of the coronavirus, COVID-19. What happened? Well, many of the courts suspended time. And what that means is that time is is just basically paused, meaning there's there's nothing going on. It's just paused. They just put a big sort of pin right in that timeline that we talked about, and there's nothing else that's going to be happening. So so whose time is that? Is that the government's time? Is that the defendant's time? 
it's really nobody's time. It's totally just paused. It's called suspending time. And so practically speaking, what it looks like is right here. So you can see here, when we, when we sort of take back our, our timeline progression, all we're doing right now is we're saying that all of this time <clears throat> is being suspended. It's all just on pause. It's not counting towards the government. It's not counting towards the defendant. You're just going to be on pause. So they're going to just break up what you saw previously in the previous slides, and it's going to insert this big dead space of time. Now, sometimes that there there is, are things that are happening here. So in, in Arizona, we have some courts where court cases are still progressing. They're still processing cases. They're still moving forward. And so we're still resolving cases. But it, it, my, my point is, is if you're a defendant, or if you're a defense attorney, or you're somebody and you're saying, well, this is a violation of my right to a speedy trial. What has happened is the, the courts have come down and said that what is happening in society is so severe, it's so important, it's so dramatic, it's so you know devastating that what we're going to do is we're going to pause that time. We're going to suspend that time. So this means that you don't get any speedy trial rights. Those are all on hold. Those are all paused throughout the board, which obviously is a pretty big problem for a lot of people. If we're talking about some of our speedy trial rights, we're talking about uh, due process issues. These are things, as I've mentioned multiple times, the Fifth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, that are all being implicated. So if the courts across the country are now saying everything's on pause, everything's on hold, okay, we can understand that and we can sort of be okay with the suspension of these liberties because the circumstances are so severe, but eventually this stuff has to come back, right? We can't have this red box go on forever and ever and ever and have people, defendants who have been charged with crimes, have this stuff just linger over their heads for, 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 for months and months and months or years and years and years. Regarding the coronavirus, we've seen some, some studies and some people saying that this stuff's not happening. Uh, you know, back to normal is not anywhere close. It's going to be going on for the next, you know, up until 2021 or 2022, some news articles have said, which is kind of insane. But the idea is that things are on pause. So what does that mean? What is what what are we going to do about that? Should we just kind of hang tight and not do anything or can we be proactive or, or what does this mean? Really? Let's start there. What does this mean? So when in law school, I had a professor who always asked me a question uh, or asked the class a question and people would tell him a rule or they would give him an analysis and he would say, so what? So what? He would say, I said it all the time. Every class, he would always come back and say, so what? What does that mean? What are the ramifications? What are the policy prescriptions that we need to, to dive through here? And so I want to answer that. We want to focus on what are the potential impacts here? How could this theoretically impact your case? And there are some pretty important points that I want to make sure that we cover. So here's what we've seen. Our office, we've seen in Arizona, we have over 180 different uh, courts. We've got some that are closed, some that are still operating telephonically, some that are still open just as business as usual. And they're just pushing their trials and certain things out for a number of, of different months. But we are seeing that some prosecutors offices are closing down and some judges are getting a little bit concerned. We were on a call last week with a local judge from a very big court here and they're trying to figure out how to still process cases while all this stuff is still pending because the police are still making arrests and they're still charging people with crimes and the justice system is staying full or getting full but they're not processing cases. So there's more coming in than are going out. And I was on the phone with two judges and they both sort of reiterated this concern and they're talking with defense attorneys and prosecutors and trying to get all of the parties to communicate and negotiate and say, this is our plan. We can still close these cases even though all this stuff is going on. So they're concerned that when the courts open back up that everybody for the last month or six weeks or two months or three months or whatever it ends up being, they're all gonna have been charged with crimes those crimes are going to go into the court system, but now the court is just going to be completely overwhelmed because they've got basically three months of court cases that they haven't worked on, all being squeezed in on the first week or two weeks or three weeks. Now they have to contend with these speedy trial uh, laws and these and these due process issues that I've been spending all this time detailing. These are all once once the order to lift the suspension is lifted or time is no longer suspended and the clock starts again. 
How are the courts going to process this? What are they going to do about it? So what does that mean for you? What does that mean for a defense attorney? What does that mean for other people who've been charged with crimes? There are some potential impacts, and I want to cover them briefly. First and foremost, as I said, I fully anticipate that there's going to be a bubble. There's going to be a bulge. There's going to be sort of a balloon that happens in court. And so does this mean that we can get better plea deals? better plea deals. I don't know. I've seen some movement on our cases here with different jurisdictions, things that they were really strict on, like home detention. They would say no home detention. Well, we get home detention now. Or in certain situations, we could not have people do online schools. They had to go in person and do a school for a diversion program. Well, now those online schools are available. So the court systems and the prosecutor's offices, they're they're accommodating. They're doing the right thing. They're making it easier to resolve these cases without sending everybody through the normal hoops that they have to jump through. So if if, if this happens, if we start to see really sort of an increased caseload, we may see some better plea deals. We may see the court just want to move these things through. So keep your eye on that. The other thing that is in, pretty important, in, in my opinion, is this idea that if, the, if this pause goes on for too long, some of the evidence that we're normally accustomed to getting may be unavailable or may not be as reliable as it once was. So for example, let's take a look at some witnesses, right? If we have witnesses in a case and they're not around anymore, maybe they have problems recalling what happened or they're not you know, wanting to appear or cooperate. They just don't want to be involved in this anymore. All of this stuff, their involvement in, the, in, the, uh, in witnessing the crime you know, happened three months ago. They just don't care about it anymore. And so they're not going to be around to come in and testify. Well, that's a big problem for the government's case if that was a key witness, if that was somebody who was critical to everything uh, going on in the case. Other investigatory problems, this, you know, these are probably less common, but spoliation of evidence. So this means that when, when you have some evidence and you need to access it or test it or store it or save it, and that evidence goes bad or goes away or disappears or degrades or something bad happens to it, that's called spoliation of evidence. It means it's, it's now gone. Things like video footage, we see this a lot when there's uh, things like you know domestic violence or there's a disorderly conduct when people are out, when there's burglaries or breaking and entering. Sometimes there's issues where the video footage is actually no longer available. So the video footage, you know, it's got a, a 36 hour sort of time uh, ex expiration. It recycles or replays over itself every 36 hours or 48 hours or evidence is not impounded or, you know, the officers who would normally be investigating crimes aren't doing the investigations because of COVID-19. So they lose access to witness. They lose access to materials. They lose access, access to evidence. So we, we, we could be seeing a, a sort of a big gap in the government's ability to produce evidence against you as a result of the coronavirus. And finally, some last sort of really big difficulties, I'm not sure how the courts are going to adapt to this, are the trial difficulties. So remember, you're entitled to a trial. In the, in the Constitution and in the Bill of Rights, you have a right to a trial. You have a right to present evidence, to cross-examine witnesses and all of those things. You have a right to a fair trial, and that includes a trial that is sort of dictated by the, the jurors, the, a cross section of your peers who can come into court, hear the evidence, make their judgment and determine your innocence or guilt. What happens when all this stuff is going on? The jury boxes in most co courts, courtrooms are not set up to comply with any of the CDC guidelines, the six foot distance, the, you know, the, the space that usually people are kind of crammed into each other. When you, when you go through jury selection in a criminal case, let's say a DUI trial, the way that you ordinarily do it is you get 40 to 50 different jurors in a room for what's called void dear, and you ask them a bunch of questions. Does anybody recognize me? Does anybody recognize the defendant? Does anybody uh, know the cop? Does anybody think he's guilty without hearing any facts? And there's you know, hundreds of different questions that you can ask depending on the type of case, but you ask them to 50 people. So the jury panel is full. There's a lot of people there. And that's not necessarily in compliance with CDC guidelines. It's not going to be something that's fixed easily unless we can sort of modify things to do things virtually or telephonically or everybody gets an iPad in a separate room and you ask everybody questions and they respond. I mean, there's some there's some interesting ways that technology can be used, I think, to, to sort of address that, but it will not be happening anytime soon. So now let's say that we take all those jurors and we ask a bunch of questions and we get our jury impaneled and we get it down to 12 people or six people or seven people or 13 people or whatever it is in your state. 
for for the specific type of crime. And now you've got uh, a jury of 12 people all sitting in the panel and they're supposed to be focused very intently on the case in front of them in the courtroom. The, the jury should be listening to everything going on. What's the defense doing? The prosecutor doing? No checking cell phones. Don't talk to anybody else. This is justice. This is very important. But then you've got Frank who's behind you in the jury panel who starts coughing and sniffling and wheezing and you're in your 50s or 60s and you're concerned about the coronavirus and so now your mind is completely hijacked by what's going on in the world around us how can you possibly be a fair juror how can you possibly give the evidence the weight that it deserves because your focus is elsewhere so what are what what are the courts going to do about that? You know, I'm not real sure. It's going to be very interesting to see how this is handled moving forward. I certainly suspect there will be some judges who just say, "Tough, this is your duty as a juror. This is your duty as an American citizen. You have to come into court and testify." And we're going to see what happens with that. We're going to see what what other uh, you know what other defendants think. We're going to see what the appeals process looks like, what the appeals court looks like. But this is something that's going to be going on for a very long time in my opinion i do not see this getting back to normal anytime soon there's going to be a lot of difficulties with trials moving forward so that's something to keep in mind as well so what does that mean for you what are the next steps what should you be thinking about moving forward in your case is there anything that you can do proactively we we, we may be you know hanging on to this for a little while we may be sitting in this sort of status of limbo with the courts for a foreseeable future and so what can you do there are things that you can do to stay proactive I, I don't want you to just think that you should be sitting there and waiting for the courts to get back to you and process your case in reality we want you to learn the specifics about your own case okay call the court write the court fax the court send them an email do something to get information about your case don't sit back and presume that the court is just going to call you and, and let you know there may be courts who are not closed so don't presume that your court is even closed to begin with if you've got a court date in the next two weeks they may expect you to be there I don't know. So it's important that you contact them and find out the specifics. What is your local court doing? Did they suspend time or not? Maybe they didn't even suspend time. Some towns, some municipalities are just not impacted by this at all. And so they're just operating as business as usual while some other places are shut down and everything is closed. So you want to be important. It's important to check with your local court and figure out what is specifically going on. Do not take the ostrich approach and just bury your head in the sand. That never works. The other thing that you want to be sure you're doing is you're staying healthy, productive, and of course, law abiding. Do your very best. I know it's a difficult time. I'm not trying to, to, to you know, tell you to do something that's impossible, but if you can stay employed, if you cannot stay employed, you got to find something to do. You got to go volunteer somewhere. You got to do something, care for your family, care for your neighbors, be a good citizen, do something proactive, do something productive. And I want you to log it. I want you to keep, keep all that stuff, keep a note, keep a journal. Uh, and I'm going to give you a mitigation form here in a minute, but do something. You want to be doing something courts, prosecutors, judges, everybody likes to see that you're being proactive and you're being a contributing member of society. Don't just, because you're unemployed, just sit on your hands for two months, three months and expect that your life is going to get better because it's not. You need to be doing something. It's, it's, it's important to be productive, okay? It also, the other reason why this is so important is because it's going to prevent you from succumbing to stress, substance abuse, and it's going to help prevent you from committing any new crimes. Of course, most people, 98% of people that we work with, they're first-time offenders and only-time offenders. They're never going to commit a crime again. And this is something that was just you know one bad night, sort of a fluke thing. So I'm not implying that you're going to be likely to go commit new crimes. But bear in mind, look, a lot of people are going through a difficult time. The fact that you've been charged with a crime on top of everything else going on right now is, in my mind, about the maximum amount of burden and stress that you can put on somebody. You are already under lockdown. Your job's already sort of in, in jeopardy, probably. I think most everybody's is. And now you're dealing with a, the criminal justice system that really doesn't know what it's doing and is sort of backwards at the moment, just like everything else is. So you've got a lot of pressure. Now, you, know, you, you may have already lost a job 
and now you may be concerned that a criminal conviction is going to make it harder to ever go find a job again, which is why it's so important to work on what I call mitigation. This is what we call it our firm mitigation. It's a very important part of how we represent people. It's important. It's something you can be doing right now, mitigating your case. Mitigation is helpful in plea negotiation. So when I talk about mitigation, what we're talking about is who you are as a person, the other side of your case, who you are as a, as a human being, as a father, as a husband, as a, as a brother, as a wife, as a sister, a spouse, you know, a friend, a neighbor, who are you aside from the criminal case? Most courts, most prosecutors, they just look at you like a name and a case number. They don't, a uh, list of charges. They don't know much about you else at all, actually. And so the idea is that you want to tell them about that. You got charged with a DUI. It was one night, but all of the other 37 years of your life, you've been a very law abiding you know, help healthy, productive person. And so we want to flesh that out. We want to explain what that is to the prosecutors. And this is a great time to be doing that. You can get character reference letters. You can get, uh, you know, gather your awards, your accolades, your transcripts. If you're still in school or you're just you know, recently out of school, you can do a lot right now that is going to set you up to catapult you into the future when this thing is over. So when you go back into court, you can show your attorney, show your prosecutor, show your judge and say, look, I've been going to AA meetings every day for the last 60 days while I've been on quarantine. I've been doing it on Zoom. Here's my check-in sheet. I've been uh, volunteering uh, over here at the food bank. People are you know, hungry. Mask, I put my mask on. I go down there with gloves and I volunteer. You're doing something. You want to come out of this and show them that you've been useful to the world. And so to help with that, we have a mitigation form that we use. Uh, here at our firm. And so I want to make that available to you. Uh, it's it's going to be in the link wherever we post this. So just hop over there, download that form if you are interested in moving forward with working on your case. Mitigation is uh, very, very important. So I want to wrap up with a couple quick things and I leave you with some takeaways. Number one, it's very unlikely that COVID-19 will materially change your case. It's, it's actually probably not going to materially change your case. It's, it's causing courts to pause your case, but there may be opportunities for better plea deals. As we discussed, there is going to be a big balloon, a big bubble of cases coming through. And so that may give you the opportunity to actually see a, a plea deal that you might otherwise not get. The other thing that's important is that timing is critical in your case. And actually the timing may present some opportunities for you. So you can, you can, you know, run into evidentiary problems. You can run into problems with witnesses and the court process is going to be complicated moving forward when we're talking about trials and cramming a bunch of people into a jury box together. It's not going to work out well. That may provide some opportunities. I don't know what they are, but the general rule in criminal law is that when things are going kind of according to plan, it's difficult to win cases. When there are things that are screwy, that's when the government screws up. That's when they, 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 they their burden is not met. They fail to meet the constitutionally mandated standards because they're not doing their job right. And when they get out of process, just like government does in general, they just they, they screw a lot of stuff up, um, just generally speaking. So when things are a mess, you may see some benefits in your case. And then finally, this is a very good opportunity to start working on mitigation. Mitigation is important. It's something that I think that really everybody should do, whether you're charged with a crime or not. It's a good kind of uh, technique, you know, just you should be proud of the things that you're doing and keep a mental list when you're applying for jobs, constantly be building out your resume, improving your skill set and doing things that you can do to, to kind of come out of this positive on the other end. You've been charged with a crime, but you're not a criminal. You've just somebody who've, who's been charged with a crime. So now what we what can we do to help kind of catapult you into the next level mitigation is a big part of that. So make sure you check the link out and download that form that I'm going to be linking. Lastly, I certainly want to make sure you know how to stay in touch. It is important to me that uh, that you get the materials and the information that you need. I mentioned it previously, but I do have a book now. It is available on Amazon. It's called Beginning to Winning. And I wrote this uh, better part of uh, 2019 and early 2020. It's available at beginningtowinning.com or it's also on Amazon. You can learn about the nine step framework that I use to process uh, criminal cases, the, the process that we use here. Three key principles for making the best decisions in criminal law. There's sort of a framework that we use 
to help you understand how to make decisions in a criminal case. And then, of course, finally, uh, forms, motions. I've got different charts. I've got uh, a lot of information about mitigation in the book. So you are, are absolutely love if you went and checked that out. Again, it's on Amazon or beginningtowinning.com. We have a Facebook group, Watching the Watchers. It's a Facebook group. It's a live show I do every week, uh, at least once every live uh, a live show once a week. I do interviews with other people in the criminal justice system. And then, of course, we have a bad popo segment that we do where we highlight and talk about bad police officers, bad prosecutors, bad judges. You can see this picture here is actually uh, from, a, from a, a board that I have up in my office where we just keep adding these guys, uh, pictures, guys and gals, their pictures to this board because they are very bad popo. And of course, if you are in Arizona, if you've been charged with an Arizona crime, feel free to reach out to uh, work with our team. Uh, we've got a, a great team here, some of the best people um, in, in the world, in my opinion. We do only criminal law, all Arizona criminal cases. We offer free case evaluations. So you can just, you know, call, get that scheduled. Not going to charge you anything to have a conversation. You can check us out at rrlawaz.com or at 480-787-0394. Just a good way to stay in touch. And we would love to talk to you. And then of course, lastly, none of those sound good. Always follow me. Hop on over to Facebook. Check out our Facebook page at Your Criminal Defense Attorney. Follow me over on Twitter at Robert Gruler ESQ. That's for Esquire. That stands for lawyer, of course. And if you're not already subscribed on our YouTube channel, you want to make sure you do that because we're going to have many more of these videos coming out in the near future. You can just go right into rrlaw.tv. Just throw that right into your browser and it'll take you over there. This was uh, was a long video. I hope you found some value out of it, 45 minutes. It's important you understand what's going on in your case. In our opinion, the best way to, to find success is to have good information, good people you can trust. That way you can sort of assemble a way to move forward. So I, I, if, you, if you have any comments, throw them in the, in the form below and uh, make sure we get those questions answered. I'd love to connect with you in one of our other forums. Thanks so much for watching. Take care, stay safe. 